Hey everybody, it's Ryan. Uh, thanks for downloading today's show. And just a reminder, as always, Wake Up War Chan is brought to you by our friends at For the Table, Madison Social, Central and Township in the heart of College Town. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, from Tallahassee to Thomasville and from coast to Atlantic coast, it's time to wake up War Chant here on 97.9 ESPN Radio, and it's a very happy Monday morning, January the 22nd to you and yours. You're currently listening to the voice of Ryan Kelly. I'm the director of digital media at WarChant.com. Good one today. Michael Langston joins us a little bit later in the show to talk about, well, the weekend that was in recruiting, some official visits for some Florida State Seminole targets. We'll talk all about that and what that means for Florida State continuing to try to make the surge towards National Signing Day. We're going to talk a little bit about the state of the program. We had Irish Affell on last week to talk about the defensive side of the ball. We're going to start talking about offense today. We might not get to everything because there's certainly some stuff to chew on there. And, of course, Florida State getting two big victories over the hardwood this weekend. We'll talk all about that. But first of all, thanks so much for waking up with us here at 6 a.m. on 97.9 ESPN Radio, WTSM app, TuneIn Radio app, iTunes, Podcast Republic, However it's going for you, whenever it's going for you, thanks so much for doing it. Rate and subscribe if you're listening via the podcast. If you give us a good review, it's always greatly appreciated. And to reach out for us, radio at warchant.com and at Wake Up War Chant. Those are your social media and your email address to get a hold of us. Okay, so we're going to welcome Irish Fell in here. Of course, the managing editor of warchant.com to talk about a plethora of things. And so let's go ahead and do that. Mr. Chaffel, good morning. How's it going, Ryan? I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm hanging I'm, in there. I'm breathing. I'm, I'm after yesterday. I'm just. I'm staying away from sharp objects and tall buildings, and uh, I'll be fine. That's <laughs> probably probably a good choice. That, that 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 was a rough one to take yesterday. I'll I will be flat honest with you. That was. Ooh. Boy, that stunk. Okay, let's talk about what didn't stink, shall we? Florida State basketball gets themselves a good win. Florida State victorious over the Virginia Tech Hokies in a game that FSU was in control for pretty much most of it. Virginia Tech hung around. They were able to cut the lead at certain points, but FSU kept their foot on the gas. They looked like a sharper team. They looked like a lot fresher team. And right off the bat, we'll talk about the implications of what it means that they won and what's up next in a second. But it was just very plainly obvious, Ira, from the get-go. That was a much fresher team than we've seen play lately. And the the curse of playing from Saturday to Monday, you saw the curse of it on Monday, going up to Chestnut Hill and losing to that Boston College team the way they did. And then you saw what five days worth of rest can do. Yeah, you know, I, you know, the thing with uh you know the last the last time out, obviously at, Mo- at Boston College on Monday night. You know, you kind of have a small sample size to work with when you start looking at how a team performs in certain situations early in conference play. So, you know, we did think it was a short turnaround last week. We thought that that's what affected them at Boston College. But what concerned you also was the fact that it was similar to how they played at Miami the week before. Um, Of course, you know, again, if you look at that situation, it was pretty similar again in terms of you were coming off of uh, big games against Duke in North Carolina. Then you go on the road to Miami. So maybe that's why they were a little bit flat in that game, but you don't want to make excuses. So you start saying, okay, well maybe this team uh, just isn't where it needs to be to win on the road. But then sure enough, they go out uh, Saturday, Virginia tech and just play great. Jumped on them early. Like you said, just had a lot of energy at both ends of the floor, shot the ball much better. Looked like the team we thought we were seeing early in the season. And uh, yeah, that's got to give you a lot of excitement and hope going forward that, uh, maybe that's the team they are when 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 all things are equal, as opposed to the team at Boston College, which just looked awful on short short rest. So here's the thing. Well, well, let's start it right off the bat with something Adrian and I talked about in the pregame chat about this, and that's MJ Walker has looked so rough over the last couple of weeks. He just hasn't been able to create shots. Anything he's got isn't falling. He just doesn't have the confidence that you expect a blue chipper like him to come in and play with. And this was finally his game. And I think part of that is because, well, when you look at that Virginia Tech team, you see that they're not really big on 
really contesting defense. They're not the biggest depth-wise team, so they're not always going to try to draw contact. They're not always going to try to draw fouls because they know it's imperative that they end up staying in that game. And even then, they ended up suffering a couple losses in that game to foul outs. Uh, But MJ Walker had a game where he had some open looks. He seemed to have some confidence, and he just knocked him down and knocked him down and knocked him down. And this was the type of game you needed to get a guy as talented as him out of that slump, especially with P.J. Savoy out what looks like for about a month now. Yeah, it was huge. I mean, coming out of halftime, I mean, Florida State played really well in the first half, but they only had three-point lead to show for it. Uh, Virginia Tech kind of chipped away at, chipped away at that lead late in the first half. And um, so you go into the second half, and you're on the road, and, and you kind of, um, you know, sometimes you worry in those situations because you know the home team's going to make a run. But MJ Walker was fantastic. And, you know, the first seven or eight minutes of the second half, he hit those three straight threes, um, you know, just uh, really aggressive. You saw him make some plays uh, defensively as well. Just, you know, he's one of those guys, especially being young, I think that, uh, you know, his defense, uh, you know, sometimes can be affected if his, if his offense isn't going or vice versa. And, uh, you know, he had it all going in that game. And then, you know, they just had so many good performances, uh, Mifiando uh, Cabangeli uh, had a really nice uh, day, had several big baskets, um, you know, just uh, really across the board. Terrence Mann didn't put up huge numbers, but it was real efficient when he did make plays. C.J. Walker had moments, hit three threes. Uh, just really was a, a game where they got so many different contributions. And, and, and again, like you said, you know, played with energy. I don't know if you can expect 24 points from M.J. Walker, uh, again, maybe this whole season we'll see. Um, but yeah, it was just good to see him come back to play the way, you know, you know, he's capable of playing, but we just hadn't seen it in the last few games. Blackshear and Clark, by the way, the guys that end up fouling out for the Virginia Tech Hokies. Funny enough, Virginia Tech ends up playing more guys in this game than Florida state due to a couple of those injuries and things of that nature. Nine guys saw the floor for the Knowles, but you're right. Uh, guys that had not been giving you solid performances lately, they all pretty much gave you a good one. Phil Kofer shot 50% from the floor, 3 of 6, 1 of 2 from beyond the arc. Uh, Chris Kamaje, 5 of 6 from the floor. Of course, really good to have his presence put back and all that. Terrence Mann, 4 of 7 from the floor, 4 of 4 from the stripe. Brian Angola is the only dude inside your starting five that didn't shoot above 50%, and even then he shot 3 of 7, and he was 8 of 10 from the stripe. Everybody gave you a good effort. MJ Walker, we already talked about him. Eight of thirteen, four of nine for fee. Uh, this was a, a as much. Even though MJ Walker's the star of the show here, this was a team win. There's no doubt about it. And I think it's impressive that they were able to push the right buttons because that's one of the things that Adrian and I talked about on Friday. We're going to find out a lot about. Leonard Hamilton, Stan Jones, that coaching staff, and the pulse that they have on this team by are they able to push the right buttons with their back up against the wall? They really needed this win. And the thing is, you could tell they were playing up to their potential. You could tell that they were playing somewhat with urgency, but there never really seemed to be a nervousness, even though this was two teams that came in with the same conference records, both really needed this win. However, Florida State, just it never really looked like it got to them. It never really looked like the moment was too big for them, even though the game was a must-win on the road against a team that puts up a lot of points. This was an impressive performance by the Knowles. There's really no other way to slice it. I I thought they would win, and I thought that they would maybe have to squeak one out or sweat it out. And don't get me wrong, there, there were a couple moments in this game, especially later when Virginia Tech tries to knock on the door, and you kind of think to yourself, oh boy, what's about to happen here? But Every time Virginia Tech had a punch, Florida State was able to counter punch. The moment was never too big for them, and they got a huge, huge, huge win. And I don't think you can understate this one, especially because, listen, you should ple- you should beat Georgia Tech on Wednesday. There is absolutely no doubt about it with that team. That is a disappointing Tech team. Sure, they can play with just about anybody. Sure, they ended up giving a little bit of a fit to North Carolina over the weekend. But here's the thing. They're not great. You're a better team. You're at home. You should get that win. And if you have it, you're back at 500 in the ACC. All is right in the world, and you can put the pedal to the metal as you go towards a huge, huge game with Miami. 
Yeah. And, you know, you touched on the, you know, just the mental toughness uh, I thought was real impressive, especially for a team. They kind of been reeling a little bit, you know, FSU had lost what three of the last four, I think uh, coming into this game against uh, Virginia tech and down the stretch. I mean, Virginia tech started hitting all those threes from everywhere and uh, you know, really, you know, really putting pressure on FSU, but FSU made it seem like almost every free throw down the stretch. I know for the game, they finished 20 of 26 from the free throw line, which again, continues this trend where they've been shooting a lot better from the line, but that's what you have to do to win on the road. You have to be able to knock down those free throws and they did it. And it's not about ability. It's about, you know, mental toughness. It's about uh, composure and, and belief and, and uh, you know, that self-confidence, which again, I was a little bit worried about with this team because they just hadn't been shooting it well. And uh, you know, they were kind of reeling a little bit the last couple times out. So uh, it's a, as you said, it's a huge win. Uh, because it gets you closer to 500. Now you've got the Georgia Tech game. The Miami game looms large. I, I, I'm i with you. I think Florida State's going to beat Georgia Tech at home. That Miami game is going to be a big game. I know uh, FSU at home, my guess is it'll be a slight favorite in that game, but it, you know, I think it'll be kind of a toss-up. Um, but Florida State really needs to win that game because, again, uh, you know this, the season's going by a little bit quicker than you would think. I mean, it feels like it's um, it still feels like it's early in the season, but man, you only have, I don't know, about 12 games left, 11 or 12 games left. Uh, they've got to get all the wins they can early. And with this stretch coming up, that's maybe a little bit softer than that closeout. You really need to get rack up these W's here and take care of business. Ira, I mentioned that there were two big basketball wins this weekend. It's not often that we'll have, um, uh, uh, some women's hoops talk in the a block of the show, but it's worth mentioning number two, Louisville, who had not lost all year, the FSU women's team who, well, let's face it, has I don't want to say had a disappointing year, but they've had a couple head scratching losses. And as you know, when you're an elite program in women's hoops, that doesn't exactly happen much. But that was a real head scratcher to uh Syracuse just about a week ago. Uh not a lot of people gave FSU a big chance in this game, but the fact that they went into the Yum Center, they hand Louisville that loss. Louisville, who by the way, shredded at Notre Dame a week ago, who's another perennial power in this sport. I think this is a big, big message for Florida State women-wise in that, listen, they're not as deep as previous teams, but they're still just as talented. And you better bring your A game because if you don't, you will get beat. Yeah, it's really a remarkable win. And, and, you know, this FSU team, a lot of people didn't really know what to expect of this women's team uh, because, you know, they did. They have lost a lot. Uh, They've had a lot of uh, turnover on that roster. And uh, they had, you know, some infusion of talent with the transfers they've had. Um, but you know, you just kind of didn't know because of the lack of depth, but, but man, that's a huge, huge win. And, uh, you know, I think, and they were down huge early. It was 22 to nine after the first quarter, uh, FSU really couldn't have played worse earlier, uh, in the early in that game, especially being on the road and, uh, for the, you know, 14,000 fans, you know, really one of the best environments in, in women's college basketball. And, uh, you know, they get it done. I mean, and the score is just crazy. They just shut down Louisville the second, third, and fourth quarters. Uh, FSU's defense was really phenomenal, and Louisville uh, just couldn't get it going. And that's one of the, you know, clearly number two in the country, one of the best offensive teams in the country, one of the best teams in the country. And FSU just shut them down, shut them down from three-point range, and uh, got a 50-49 to win. You don't see many uh, FSU women's basketball games in the 40s or 50s, uh, but that's just an incredibly impressive win. Sue certainly does like to score points. There's no doubt about that. And that's not a type of game that you'll see every day. You're absolutely right. So to get that type of win, I think, is one that kind of sets them on the right course. And this was a nice reset weekend for both of those teams coming off some head-scratching weeks, being able to just kind of take a deep breath, reset. One gets a win that I don't think you can understate the importance of a win like that for the program and the women. And another one, Florida State just being able to the men's team getting right back on course, just beating a team that you think you can beat a team that, you know, you can beat and getting some production out of a freshman that you desperately needed it from. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to step aside. We're going to take a break and we come back. We're going to talk a little bit about football. Ira's continuing his state of the program series. And over the weekend, he got to turn his attention to running back, which by the way, on the offense outside of the quarterback battle, I think is one of the most curious positions that you will see 
as Willie Taggart takes the reins at Florida State. Take a break. Talk about it after this. It's Wake Up War Channel 97.9 ESPN Radio. Brought to you by your friends at For the Take. If you're a bitter and depressed Jags fan like me, or if you're happy about the Florida State win over the weekend, or you're a Patriots or an Eagles fan, or you're a sad Vikings fan, or whoever you are, maybe you need a beverage this evening. And I will tell you, the best happy hour in town to go get that said beverage is Madison Social Central and Township. Our friends at For the Table have the hookup for you right there in the heart of College Town. You know where they are. Right across from Doe Campbell Stadium, right in the shadow. Great view in this great capital city of ours. It's three different places, it's three different experiences, but you're always going to get the same great deal from the best happy hour in town. Our friends at For the Table hope you're there tonight. All right, Ira, let's shift gears as we continue on with the managing editor of Warchant.com, Ira Chaffel, and change to football for a sec. Last week, we got to talk about the defensive side of your State of the Program series. We're going to talk about your offensive one probably a couple times this week. But I wanted to start with what you put out over the weekend, and that's running back. There's plenty of depth, and you wonder if there are enough touches to go around. And that's where I think this whole Florida State team gets fascinating, especially in the spring, to see how many guys get happy. But the good news is you know you're going to be running the ball a lot here in the Gulf Coast offense. This position, and I said it before we went to break, Ira, maybe outside of a quarterback battle or which quarterback ends up taking the reins intrigues me more than any other on Florida state's team in 2018. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, especially with Jacquez Patrick uh, deciding to come back for his senior year, you know, a lot of us kind of wondered if he might uh, declare and go pro, not necessarily because he's going to be a top first or second round draft pick, but just because, you know, look, I mean, Cam Akers kind of established himself when, when, when Patrick got hurt, uh, Cam Akers kind of established himself as, as the lead back, the feature back. Even when Patrick came back from his injury, Cam Akers continued to start um, and had a great season. Now, yards per carry, uh, interestingly enough, uh, Patrick Jacquez actually averaged 5.6 yards per carry, where Akers averaged 5.3. I think most people would be surprised by that. But but Akers obviously brings a little bit more of a game-breaking style to more of a kind of power-running style of Jacquez Patrick. Um, but, you know, look, man, I think that, uh, you know, with that position, the one thing we've learned through the years, even if you go into a season feeling like, man, we've got so many running backs, how are we going to keep them all healthy? I, I, I think back to the early 2000s. I remember there was a year when, you know, FSU brought in Leon Washington and Lorenzo Booker, and they, they already had Greg Jones and Nick Maddox and uh, all these talented running backs. And everybody said, well, how would you keep them all healthy? But, you know, either guys get banged up or, or different things happen. And so you end up needing that depth at that position. So, um, you know, I, I agree with you going into the season. That's going to be the big question, especially when you talk about, you know, not only do you have Patrick and Akers, but you've got guys like Amir Sewell and Kalen Laybourne and uh, Zaquandre White, who redshirted last year with Laybourne. Uh, how would you keep all of those guys happy? But running backs, one of those positions, man, you never probably have enough running backs. I'll agree with you there, and I'll say more than anything, I'll go back to something I said in the fall, going to camp, uh, the few practices that we were able to see throughout the 2017 season in fall camp. Kalen Laybourne, at least in the open periods, we got to see Ira, and you can stop me if I'm wrong. But to me, in the little bit that we got to see, and granted, it was only a couple periods, looked better than Cam Akers. And I, I know there was plenty of talk about what Kalen Laybourne was able to bring to the table I'm super excited to see what he can do with the ball in his hands, especially in an offense like this. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing about Laybourne is, you know, he's a different style guy a little bit. He's not quite as uh, powerful as, as Cam Akers is. I think Cam Akers is probably uh, a better runner between the tackles, a little bit more physical. But Lay Laybourne was, you know, if you remember coming out of high school, he was listed as an all-purpose back. Um, and that's right. He's a guy that I'm kind of curious to see how Willie Taggart uses. Um, you know, again, uh, you know, even though Willie Taggart 
is kind of a spread offensive guy, is known for that. Uh, he also loves to run the football. You look at the numbers Royce Freeman put up at Oregon. You think back to the running game. They had Marlon Mack and uh, the De- Dearness Johnson at USF uh, and the, the way he ran his quarterback as well. Everything they do is really to kind of set up the running game. And, and a lot of times you spread people out so you can run the football. So I think, you know, Patrick and Akers and, and all those guys will be used a lot. Uh, and they'll probably rotate those guys a lot because you, you play at that up-tempo pace. But also, I kind of wonder about Laybourne um, and also a guy like Deontay Sheffield, who's a, who was a walk-on but is supposed to go on scholarship, kind of not 100% sure on how that's all working out. But he was a really uh, a well-thought-of running back coming out of high school. He's another guy that maybe could become like a slot receiver. You just kind of wonder if maybe a, one or two of those guys gets a look at a uh, receiver just because FSU's a little bit thin at receiver and uh, certainly loaded at running back. Ira, I'm sure we'll end up talking a little bit more about this offense later in the week, but we are all out of time, my friend. Thank you so much. Sounds good, Ryan. Take care. All right, when we come back, recruiting chatter with Michael Langston. Wake Up War Chant, 97.9 ESPN Radio. Brought to you by your friends at For the Table. All aboard the Tiger Train. I'm really excited about FSU football and the Willie Taggart era. Did you hear there's also a new era happening at Warchant.com? Did Warchant get a new coach? No, but they did get a star player. Corey Clark is joining the team. Between Gene Williams, Ira Chaffel, and Corey, that's nearly 50 years of experience covering the Seminoles. Glad I finally took advantage of that 30-day free trial offer and subscribed. And now we get the added bonus of reading Corey Clark's insight into the Knolls. Warchant.com, your your ultimate ultimate Seminole Seminole sports sports source. March to National Signing Day continues, and, well, uh, Florida State hosted a lot of talented visitors over this weekend. If you were around Tallahassee, you more than likely, well, if you were around campus, that is, you more than likely saw the um, uh, uh, Jimbotrons. Well, not the Jimbotrons anymore. I'm just so used to calling them that, but uh, the Jimbotrons. I guess we got to get back to calling them the Warboards, like they used to call them back in the day. But, yeah, uh, the Warboards were lit up with highlights all weekend. The war chant was blaring from Doak Campbell Stadium, and Willie Taggart still trying to put together his number one recruiting class. And by number one, I mean his first, not actually ranked number one. That'd be something, but of course, I think you know what I meant. His first recruiting class ever at Florida State, trying to salvage uh, a class that didn't have a lot not too long ago, but now finds itself inside the top 25. To help us out with that, we have our own Mr. Michael Langston, of course, the senior recruiting analyst at warchant.com. Here to join us, and Michael, let's dig straight into this, my friend. Uh, Big-time visitors, Jalen Hall, Cameron McDonald, Andrew Chatfield, all visited campus. Uh, They ended up there on Friday. Also some California guys as well. It's interesting to see how that California pipeline's gone on. We'll talk about these guys all individually in a second, but first of all, your overall impression of how this weekend went for FSU. Well, I think it went really well. I mean, I think they, they hit on key points they wanted to with each one of them and certainly had great weather to you know, host these kids. They got them in pretty early, didn't have to, you know, didn't get them in late where you'd you know you'd have to spend an extra day uh, where, where they got to get on the road tomorrow and you know, get back at it. But, you know, I think everything went pretty smoothly. And I think uh, I think the vibe I got coming off the visit for all these guys is that, uh, you know, they're feeling pretty good of everything they got accomplished. So that being said, let's start talking about the California pipeline, uh, the guys visiting from out there, and what Florida State's been able to do in such a relatively short amount of time in getting some of these guys from the West Coast on board. Yeah, you have uh, Karen McDonald tied in uh, from Long Beach Poly. Uh, he's a guy that's already committed to him, uh, but still he hadn't visited FSU, so it was important for him to see everything. Uh, it said uh, the city of Tallahassee really blew him away. I mean, he really liked, uh, you know, the town. It wasn't just like, you know, just you had your clicks or anything as far as teams. He said everyone was just a, you know, good family and just. He also liked the city of Tallahassee, just how wide open it is. He said there's plenty to do, and uh, he seemed to be really impressed by that. But I think he was also impressed that, you know, everything that Taggart's been telling him, you know, he kind of showed him more of that uh, when they started breaking down film and just kind of showing how they were going to be used. So 
I think he was he was very uh, excited. He brought his family with him, and and they also fell in love with everything. So I think uh, everything's good to go there. Now his teammate, I guess the big target this weekend is Jalen Hall, wide receiver, uh, Rivals one hundred. Uh, also plays for Long Beach Poly. Close friend of his. I think you know everything I got from his visit, and I haven't talked to Jalen uh, yet, but. Everything I got from that visit was uh, it was extremely positive. That it, it went really well. Uh, had a really good meeting with which Coach Taggart and uh, connected really well with the the players from what I could gather. I mean that, that's what I was told most of the you know, the weekend while he was there. That um, that was a big part of his visit was you know how he would connect with the players. You know how how a kid from California feels about the culture is always big when they come in for a visit, and I think um, certainly. Jalen felt that, so I think it's a you know close battle with Oregon or FSU, but I think FSU's uh, you know feeling um, you know, feeling that they hit on everything and and they're feeling pretty positive about you know where they stand currently. Now we'll have to wait and see a couple of days what happens if that visit wears off, but I think they're feeling pretty good as far as where they stand right. Going back to Cameron McDonald, I think it's interesting that he ends up bringing in the emphasis that Tallahassee was a place that he liked because I, I do kind of find that fascinating, especially as Florida State starts to open up this West Coast pipeline. A uh, college town in the South is a way different feel than Long Beach or Los Angeles or any of those big time, big cities on the West Coast. And I, I know there are plenty of more rural areas in California, and I'm I'm not here to say Tallahassee's a rural area, but it's not exactly uh, it's not exactly the city of angels. And I, I think that's yeah. that's a fascinating point there when you're coming to some of these guys from some of these big places. It's a lot different than recruiting, you know, five star superstar out of South Georgia somewhere or out of Lake City. And that's no offense to either of those places. But I mean, Florida State's obviously recruited its fair share from Orlando and Miami and Jacksonville and Tampa over the years, but the guys on the West Coast, it's a completely different vibe out there with some of the colleges you'll visit there compared to some of the colleges you'll visit here. Uh, that is one of the things that I think is interesting, that immediately right away, walking away from me, he said, yeah, I like being there. Yeah, I mean, he mentioned a lot of diversity, you know, as far as uh, the city of Tallahassee, uh, you know, just a lot of people doing different, doing their own thing where, you know, he said from some schools that he's visited – I don't know if he meant the West Coast or just in general. I would say probably West Coast because most of his teams were West Coast teams. And he just said everything, everyone else you know, is always doing the same thing at these places where there was more diversity. A lot of people are doing different things. And, you know, he felt really comfortable there. And it, it's it's always interesting when you get, uh, you know, vibes of kids that never visit a place and they're from a different, you know, a totally different area. Jalen Hall, of course, you mentioned another Long Beach guy. How big of a get would this be for Florida State? Well, I think it'd be massive because it's one of your biggest positions in need. Uh, obviously, they look good, I think, for Warren Thompson. You already have Demarcus Adams. You know, you want like three or four in this class. We've already mentioned his teammate Cameron um, is is a tight end, but the tight ends in the, in the Taggart offense are kind of used as receivers, so yeah, you, know, you could almost add him to the receiver group, but you know, if you if you got him, it would make your path to filling every receiver. You know, you know all the amount of receivers that you want in this class. I think it'd make it an easier, you know, way of going that way. As far as uh, you know, if you got him, then you got you know, like I mentioned, Warren Thompson, and and maybe one more. I think it makes the journey easier, but um, certainly be a big pickup because he's a guy that is a big target can, can do it on different things can certainly spread the field. And, and, uh, it also keeps that, you know, connection to the California area going strong. Chatfield, the other guy you mentioned, of course, here from the state plantation, American heritage mm -hmm. guy, he's visited Florida. He's visited Miami. He's visited Oklahoma. Uh, here's the thing. When you have guys on this list, like Hall and Chatfield, Priority number one has to be dudes like this because, well, you mentioned it with wide receiver, positions of need in a big, bad way, and Florida State could use more linebackers. Yeah, and I think that's what they really hit home this weekend with him was, you know, they, they don't have a lot of, you know, you could go through that roster, and they don't have a lot of depth at that linebacker position. Uh, you know, 
Emmett Rice got hurt in the last game of the year. You know, who knows what his situation is going to be going into next year. So you don't really have a lot of guys, and and you're certainly going to have to, you know, get you you would want to get you know two or three, maybe four to have in this class. So you know, I'm certainly I'm, based on what I had heard, the FSU really sold that hard as far as uh, you know needing big time players that can play early and. It's not just you're coming in. I mean, you're coming in to play. I mean, they're coming in because they want you to play right away. So I think they did a very good job selling that. I mean, coming into this, I thought Miami held a pretty solid lead. But you know, I was surprised that the positive reaction I got from you know the FSU side that um, you know they feel they really made a strong, strong showing as far as uh, this week, and they're they're feeling they got a you know solid chance of pulling this off. So. I think it comes down to those two, FSU and Miami. But I think he, I think the main thing I told people was he's really got to bite on this um, early playing time and how much he's going to be used and how he's going to be used. And it sounds like that they really sold that pretty well, and he was very receptive to that. So it sounds like uh, that's really put them certainly uh, a major player in this in this mix. So I'm interested timeline wise. Are these dudes that Florida State is thinking they can get committed before signing day? Just in terms of targets in general, not necessarily these guys specifically. But what is Florida State's strategy kind of here? Is this sweat this out still towards signing day, or hoping now that you're starting to get some momentum with some of these dudes, get them in the bag before then? And what what, what realistically are they looking at? I know obviously best case scenario is everybody get everybody they want commits immediately, but. Yeah. Best case scenario, what what is Florida State looking at here? Well, I mean, I think the main object is, you know, to fill, you know, your needs as far as, you know, three linebackers, four receivers. I don't think there's actually a timeline. Obviously, they, you know, they would look, want these guys to commit right away after the visit. I think it's important, especially for you know, West Coast kids, you know, after they visit to commit, you know, uh, not too long after that because – once you visit them, you should have a pretty good idea that, hey, this is the place I want to be at. So, you know, if you don't hear anything for a week, then, you know, I'd say, you know, maybe that visit's kind of worn off a little bit. But, you know, if he does jump on it early, I think the expectation is, you know, uh, certainly that's kind of what they want. You know, they want early commits. They would want these guys to jump on board, especially at two positions of need, like receiver and linebacker. I mean, I think they, I'm pretty sure they've told them, like, hey, we need bodies, but – We'd also like to know who's coming. So you know, I'm sure they're not pushing and pressuring the kids to make a decision, but how it would be bit of beneficial for them you know, going forward if they got them early. So weekend in the book seems to have gone pretty well. What's the next step here for Florida State, next big date that people need to know? Well, I mean, you have this week, they're certainly going to visit a lot of kids like they did this uh, you know, past week. Uh, you know, confirming visits, confirming they're coming on campus. Because the next two weeks is going to be crazy for FSU because you're hosting, you know, five or six visitors uh, every weekend. So, you know, coming up on the, you know, 26, you have a big visit with Dennis Briggs coming up. Uh, wide receiver Demarcus uh, Adams is also coming in. You have linebacker Xavier Peters is coming in. So, you know, there this is a very important weekend where this weekend kind of is the prelude to set up, you know, the bigger weekends coming up. But, it's going to be a busy week for the coaches on the road, even bigger week for these coaches when they host uh, these recruits because you basically have two weeks left. I mean, this is a, they know they got to nail this. And, you know, and don't be surprised if a guy like, uh, you know, running back Maurice Washington shows up for an official visit next week. I mean, it would not surprise me. He's a running back they've kind of kept their eyes on. But um, it, it, we could see a lot of surprises like that, Ryan, where we have currently like there's supposed to be five or six visitors, but that thing could balloon all the way up to 10 or 11. So we just don't know. But, you know, that they want to nail down these last two weekends, you know, to knock it out of the park. And they know how pivotal these last two weekends. You basically have eight or nine spots that are left in this class, and they know they need to get this done. And I think that's uh, what they're locked in on. So let's say what happens and follow me here because I know I've asked similar questions in the past, but I, I, I want to ask it with the momentum at Florida state's back with it kind of starting to surge a little bit. If Florida state finished a, with a recruiting class, say in the top 10, would it surprise oh. you? 
I think it would surprise me a little bit just because of the sheer numbers and, you know, the fact that they're – I mean, they just basically have had no time to do I, – I think I think they should talk about giving the key to the city if you get a top ten class. I mean, because that's, that's an amazing job. I think realistically, I think if they get the guys that, you know, I've mentioned that I think FSU leads for, I think you're talking between 12 and 15, you know, as far as the final place. Now, if you get a few surprises – you might reach that top 10 mark, but you know, and I've said this many times, right? I mean, it's amazing the job, you know, that Taggart and them have done based on, you know, the limitations they were put in the situations they were put in, you know, to start this thing. And um, so it, it's finally starting to come around a little bit. And here's the thing, guys, they're not going to get every guy, like they're not going to get every target. They're not going to get every main target. But the main thing is, you know, right now it seems like they're going to fill the, the key needs that they need to get. And that's, I think, the most important thing for this class. But I'd say between 12 and 15, right? Okay. Well, I'm happy I asked you 10 instead of 15, though. Cause, uh, so <laughs> okay. the, the, the forecast in and of itself, I, I think the idea that it's even within the top 15, even though you knew that Florida State was going to get numbers just because there was, there was nowhere to go but up. But I still think the mm-hmm. idea of being in the top 15 – just after seeing the number, just after seeing, oh God, six or sixty somethingth, oh God, fifty somethingth, oh God, forty mm-hmm. somethingth, to make that leap with the cards you were dealt, even if you knew that Florida State was going to bring in more numbers and you knew they were going to bring in more recruits, it's still kind of jarring to see, and it's a tip of the cap to Willie and company. Yeah, it's an amazing job they've done. I mean, they've connected with a lot of kids. They've gotten some kids that they had previous relationships with, and got them on campus and you know, they've already got a couple of them and you know, might have some more coming. So, it, I mean, it just, it just shows you their recruiting ability and also the ability to build relationships and how they build them for a long extended time. And, you know, now they just want to finish those last eight or nine guys off with the guys they want and the guys that are going to fill the key needs that they need, like, you know, linebacker, um, certainly receiver, defensive end and uh, probably quarterback. But, I think those – I mean, they, they do those things and they land the guys they think they're going to land. Uh, I think uh, it's a tremendous job, without a doubt. All right, Michael. Thanks so much. Always appreciate it. You got it, man. Michael Langston, the senior recruiting analyst of Warchant.com. Okay, so here comes the bittersweet part of this show. You're probably wondering, Ryan, you let him go with a couple minutes early. So – Here's what we're going to talk about really quick. A a couple weeks ago, I got a pretty awesome opportunity to uh, rejoin the folks at WCTV full-time. And they've been good to me over the years. War Chant's been good to me over the years. As many of you know, over the last year, year and a half or so, I've been working for both. And I've been able to do incredible things and meet incredible people and cover incredible events with both of them. But... With a full-time role over there, it means that I'm not going to be able to do this show anymore with Warchant. And that means within the next two weeks, I'm going to be doing my last Wake Up War Chant with you here on 97.9 ESPN Radio. Now, uh, for everything I have heard, the show completely plans on continuing. I most certainly know that Warchant will have an audio presence in some way, shape, or form. That's for everybody else to decide, but I am leaving this gig with absolute gratefulness. I'm so grateful to Gene for giving me the shot, and I'm so grateful to Ron Vetrano, who gave us a remarkable shot to put this on the air. I mean, we we were a podcast for six months, and we did really well, and I liked our numbers, and I loved the product that we put out, and I loved just being able to talk to you. But the fact that we went from that to radio to our numbers holding up incredibly well over these last couple years has been remarkable. And the only person and people that I can thank for that is you. I know it's cliche at the end of a radio show when someone comes on and says, thanks for listening, but I truly mean it because we can't do this without you. We would not be able to keep the lights on over our head and keep our families fed and have a place to stay if no one listened to the show. And you've done it, and you've supported us so loyally throughout the years. And I hope whoever and whatever's next for War Chant, you support the next guy. Because I know that the people here 
are going to continue to work extremely hard. They're going to continue to be extremely great. And this show is going to continue on in some way, shape, or form. So my intro song, the, the, the song we use at the beginning of the show, it's Are You What You Want to Be by Foster the People. I, I love that song. I love that band. I got to see them live in October. It was actually Wake Forest weekend. I was able to see them the day before in Orlando, and they put it on an amazing show. If you're a fan of alternative music, you owe it to yourself to go see those guys. But there's a reason that I choose that song, and that's because every morning when I wake up, I listen to that song and I ask myself that question. Because I've always sworn to myself, if the answer to that question, are you what you want to be, is no, I'll quit. I'll move on. I'll do whatever it is. And we've done several hundred episodes of Wake Up. And every morning or whenever we pre-record the show, and I have to put that in and post, and every time I listen to that song, I can say unequivocally, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the answer has been yes. Talking about this team, talking with you, and talking with some of the nicest people in the world. Ira Chaffel, Corey's new, but Corey has been excellent since he's been on. Of course, we knew Corey from before he came over to War Chant. Ryan Clark, of course, longtime beat writer with us, well, came in with me. And we were in this thing together, and we came on, and we, we forged such a great friendship. Gene has always been a pleasure to talk to. Michael has always been a pleasure to talk to. Adrian Crawford has always been a pleasure to talk to. And, of course, sharing a radio booth with Drew for the better part of a year was an absolute thrill and an absolute honor and I've loved it and I've loved sharing it with you because at the end of the day the only thing that's more outrageous than making a career throwing a ball around and playing a kids game is making a career talking about people playing a kids game and the fact that you let me do it and the fact that you let the rest of us do it and the fact that we're all able to enjoy sports together that's why sports talk is so much fun, is because there's something liberating about it. Because you can walk up and down a radio dial or up and down an iTunes podcast, and you can find some horrible, depressing things. You, you can find some horrible things about war and about politics and about awful things. And we get to talk about people throwing a ball around. And it, it's just like, you know, last night I was heartbroken. Absolutely heartbroken at the end of that AFC title game. And uh, I've got plenty of thoughts about it, but I'm going to spare you. And I'm just going to say, when when you do this and then you open up your Twitter feed or you open up your front page or the newspaper or whatever news website you go to, whatever it is, and you, you open it up or when you do in my part, go to a TV newsroom every day. And you hear about what's going on in some other part of the world, or you hear about what's going on somewhere, you think to yourself, God, I'm happy to be talking sports today. God, I'm happy this is the worst problem I have in my life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know I've probably talked for a little bit too long, but I, I can't understate what a blast this has been to come into your homes. And we're not done. I, I've got at least two more weeks with you. We're going to have a blast. We're going to talk about this basketball team. We're going to talk more about the wind-up to signing day. And we're going to talk probably a little preseason baseball as well. In case you haven't noticed, Florida State's got a baseball team that's going to be really, really good. You're still going to hear from me. I'm still going to be around in Tallahassee. I'm still going to be covering FSU sports as well as the news around here. So let's keep in touch. But continue to support War Chant. Continue to support this show and the great people that work for it. Let's have some fun. My thanks to Mike. My thanks to Ira. My thanks as always to you for listening. Bullock and Wingo's up next on 97.9 ESPN Radio. Warchant.com is the ultimate inside source for FSU football and recruiting. And now you can get in on the action for free for an entire month. Warchant.com is offering a risk-free 30-day trial subscription. Get full access to the number one website covering the Seminoles just by entering the promo code WARCHANT30. That's WARCHANT30. Sign up and get in on the world's most active FSU message boards. Receive breaking news stories from our award-winning staff, plus get exclusive interviews and videos. Just enter the promo code WARCHANT30. WARCHANT.COM, your ultimate Seminole sports source.